welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, where we speak about personal finance and entrepreneurship. This is episode number 69. Today, we have a different kind of interview. Today, I am being interviewed by my friend, Daniel Davis, who also have no one, no two, but three podcasts. Now, I met Daniel at our local club, McGill Toastmasters, but he is also an investor, he's an entrepreneur, and he is a bodybuilder, and as you just heard, a podcaster. So, let's listen to the interview. Alan, I know you from Toastmaster, from our Toastmaster club. I'm wondering how you have started your entrepreneurship journey. Do you have the luxury of the time to share with us how it all started and where are you now? Okay, the way I started my entrepreneur journey. So, you know, just like you, I am an immigrant. And when I came here, I didn't want to run a risk of not being accepted by immigration. So what I did is that I applied for a student visa and I knew that as long as I showed that I could pay for my education, I, was, I should get accepted. Okay, so I did the application, the university accepted me, Concordia University in Montreal. And the thing that happened is that I only have money for the first year. Okay, I didn't have more money for other than that. So I started working, and one of the jobs that I had was as a janitor. So what I did is I had a little Walkman, because that was 20 years ago, and I used to record my classes at business school. And then when I was working at night as a janitor, cleaning floors and toilets and all this and that, I used to listen to my classes. So that's how I managed to pass university. I didn't have much time to study. But, you know, I would listen to the classes while I was working. I was able to pay for the school and, and graduate. And you know what? That's one of the reasons why I don't understand how come students get out of school with so much debt because it is doable. I mean, I was working a minimum wage and I didn't know anyone when I came here and I was able to make it. Now, for a regular Canadian who lives here, who have connection, family, and who knows how the system works, they have all these advantages. They speak the two languages without problems, There's no accent, there are white, blue eyes, and this and that. And there's a lot of people with student debt, and there is no excuse for that. Everyone should hear this education is so inexpensive compared to other countries in the world that there is no excuse for coming out of a school with thousands and thousands of dollars in student debt. Okay, so I graduated and I work in, as a financial advisor, okay, but I hated my job. I hated my job because what I discovered in the financial industry is that we are supposed to sell products to people, not to help people out, but to make our company and ourselves rich. So we were encouraged to sell the products with the highest commission. And of course, if the client made a little bit of money, even better, but that was not the priority. The priority was for us to make money. And you know what? I just couldn't do it. It's almost like, you know, there's people who sell cigarettes in the cigarette companies and, and they can live with that. You know, they are making money while doing harm to somebody else. And I couldn't sell financial products knowing that there were better alternatives out there, that people could use other products that would cost them less, that would, they would earn more money, and they would have a better financial life. So I quit after one year because I had a one-year contract and then I didn't have a job. I was unemployed. And it so happens that when I was a student at university, I used to teach dance classes for free. And I said, okay, now I'm going to teach a few dance classes. I'm going to charge money while I find another job. And I posted announcements all over the university. My, I bought advertisement in the legal, in the small classified newspaper. And little by little, I started having two, three, six, eight students. And I found out that I was spending more and more time teaching classes, and I didn't have time to look for a job. And so I started 
thinking, what am I going to do? I don't have time to look at, for a job. But then I realized that I was paying all my bills. I was paying for my rent, for my food, and that I was happy. I was happy. I was dancing with these beautiful girls who were taking <laughs> dance classes with me. And I said, why, if I'm happy and I, I'm paying all my bills, then why continue to go into the corporate world when I can continue having this kind of independent life? And I continued doing that, but then I went all in. I mean, I put all my effort and, and, and energy into it, and it became a big business in a way that I had 200 students oh. at any given moment. Uh, there were classes where I was getting paid uh, regularly $200 an hour, but I became a workaholic. 10 hours per day, six, seven days a week. And, but I didn't mind because I was enjoying and loving my work. But after, you know, six, seven years, I began to long for another, you know, just to be able to have coffee from time to time with my friends, just to, in order to go and visit my family. So uh, I was going through a burnout period, and I stopped that. I stopped my dance school. I was burned out, but luckily I had saved a lot of money. And then I got into the Airbnb business. Mm. So I had a business partner, and between she and I, we rented properties in the city of Montreal. And then those properties, we put it for rent in Airbnb. Mm. And that became a money-making machine as well, because Airbnb was in infancy here in Montreal. And, and practically, I mean, we focus on having good quality properties but practically anyone could put any dump uh, or a couch or whatever and it would get rented. So being that we had good reviews, we did good. But then guess what happened? After five years, I got tired of it. Oh <laughs> okay, so, so and then for a moment, I also became an Uber driver. Mm -hmm. uh, Uber was completely new and I said, okay, I'm going to try this. And it was at the time where Uber was illegal and... Uber drivers were making lots of money. And I think I was making about $30 an hour wow. just driving for Uber. I didn't drive that many hours, but I did it for two years. And, you know, I, I, see, I see people complaining about Uber is not paying the drivers enough. But you know what? I see it as a great opportunity because I, any driver could just I tell you, one time I was suffering from insomnia. I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning. I said, what am I going to do? I jumped into my car. I did that night at 3 o'clock in the morning, three rides to the airport, and I make a couple of hundred dollars, and then I went to sleep at 6 o'clock. And imagine that, you know, that flexibility. If you are an attorney, you cannot just be an attorney for two hours and then and then do nothing. You know, you had to be committed and you had to pay all these fees and you had to have a secretary and a building and a boss and all this and that. But as an Uber driver, you can just drive a couple of hours. And if you don't want to drive anymore, you just don't drive anymore. And the level of, of, uh, of skills that you need is just being able to drive a car. <laughs> so anyway, so... Uh, uh, that's that. While I was doing Airbnb, I also became a um, property owner. I bought a few properties, and those properties, kind of rental properties, they help me nowadays in my day-to-day -day living. So, yeah, that's been more or less my entrepreneurial journey. It's, uh, it's, it's just jumping from one ship to the other, trying one thing. I had the tendency of burning out, so now I'm focusing on just working as least as possible. So in order not to burn out and, and it's working out, I'm, I'm very happy with how it's going right now. Well, it's a long and impressive journey. I can even, you can, you, I think you can even make it as a book. You know, well, who knows? <laughs> but uh, what is your last uh, venture that you have just started? I know that you are so into photography these days. Yes, okay, so the photography, I was coaching someone and this person she was telling me that she wanted to be a photographer but she was afraid she didn't have any training but she had a nice camera and she was taking beautiful pictures she was going and working on her skills every week and she was she was afraid and i was trying to encourage her just to jump to start doing something i told her listen yes this claim that you are a beginner photographer 
and the, and put a very low price and people know that they're taking a risk with you but you know you have to start somewhere and she pushed back and she said oh no you know i need a lot of training i just don't dare to miss that picture whenever the bride and the groom are kissing i'm just too afraid and so i told her listen i'm going to do it i'm going to put a buy a camera i'm going to put an ad and i'm going to test the water for you okay and i did it i bought a camera i read a few blog posts on how to do photography of course i've been taking photos for a long time as a hobby and i just put an ad it says uh, amateur beginner photographer who charge 20 dollars an hour for your event and guess what happened people started writing to me people started saying hey you know uh, can you do our birthday party can you do our business lunch and every time I went to one of those events, I started learning more and more on how to, how to be present, how to be here and there and ask this lady to smile and ask this gentleman to hold hands with his partner. And uh, so that's, that's how the business had developed. And the first year, I had like 20 contracts, 20 requests. The second year, 40. And now I'm in the third year and only in the first six months I had 30 uh, gigs and I assume maybe for the other part of the year I will have another 30 gigs. So it's, it's, going, it's going well. I'm, I'm loving it. I'm getting to know a lot of people and people are offering me. I'm not, I'm not increasing my prices. People are offering to pay me more each time that I do a different gig. So if you do a good work, people will refer you and, and it's just... The thing is that it develops slowly. But how do you get customers? Is it all about word of mouth or you get do advertisement or how do you market yourself? So the advertisement at the beginning has been and still works very good. I uh, just local classify ads in Kijiji and I think that's the, the website that most people use for classify ads. I don't pay for any advertisement. I don't pay uh, Google or Facebook. I just put free advertisement. But then what happened is that uh, if I do a good job, then people refer me. And, and I have also done a lot of free events. So I see events that are happening and I offer my fair services for free. But then for any of one of those events, I have always gotten one, two, or even three referrals. So it's building up. Like I said, the first year it was only 10 and then the second year 20. And then that number is not because of increase of advertisement, but because of the increase of referrals. So that's how it's working out. Well, in the past, people used to go to the stores, and I saw the guy has a store, he has permission to work, he has certificates, and now how come that people go online and find and someone and they trust him without asking for any credentials or any certificate? How the world has changed? Well, uh, uh, photography in particular, but this is not just photography. There are many businesses where you don't need a university degree, you don't need permission from the permission giver, you don't need a magician to give you a tap on the shoulder and give you these superpowers, you just have to start doing the work. Like my photography work, if I had a diploma, let's say from a, a prestigious university, as a photographer, I still wouldn't be able to get photography work without building relationships. So there are many jobs that the way that you make it work is by building relationship. It's not by the diploma or by because so and so tells you that you are qualified. So let's say, let's say that you want to start developing websites. Okay, you take a few courses in YouTube. You don't need a school for that. You offer to build a few websites for free. And then you use those free websites as, as referral. And as long as you continue educating yourself, then it, it works into a business. So uh, it could be uh, graphic design. You take uh, f so some classes in YouTube, you, uh, Udemy, or, or many of other free places. And you offer to do a few, few free graphic design. And all of a sudden, in a few years, you have a business. SEO, it's the same thing. So there are a ton of businesses that you just don't need the permission from the big institution and from the big employer. You don't need any of that. It costs, you can build a website for free or, or at the worst, 
you pay five dollars per month for a website and the rest is skype is for free paypal well they charge you two percent to receive money but with that a website paypal you have an international business with practically no investment the only investment is your time and that's the same way that i have developed my photography business i i open a website cost me five dollars per month and i just spend some time just reading and networking networking in, in, in photography and many other business is the key to success. And, and so, yeah, anyone can do it, my friend. So tell us one of your best experiences in photography, one of the f- most fulfilling experiences that has given you, wow, I'm doing these photography things, and now, look, I'm meeting this kind of people, or I'm just having this kind of experience. Uh, a fun experience, well, a few days ago, I was the phot- photographer for the Spartan race. Mm. So uh, one thing that I do when I do photography is that I like to interact with the people that I'm, uh, that I'm photographing. And in the Spartan race, I was encouraging people to continue running or climbing or jumping or whatever as I was, uh, as I was taking photos of them. The problem with that is that there were 5,000 participants. So in two days, I was screaming to 5,000 people, and by the time I finished, well, first of all, I had sore hands from taking (laughs) more than almost 10,000 photos, and the second thing, I didn't have any voice because I spent so much time (laughs) screaming uh, at them. But uh, another thing interesting is uh, last week, I was hired by a corporation to take photos on top of the Olympic Stadium, Mm. and that was amazing. It's a huge, amazing view. You, uh, amazing music, food, drinks, uh, everything that you could. You, I, I felt almost like I was on top of the world. I was getting paid to listen to this great band. I was taking lots of photos, interacting with people, and at the end of the evening, I went with a bag of sushi with me and, a, and my pocket full of money. Wow, it's interesting, impressive. So, Alan, tell us where people can find you. Well, my website, I have a photography website, alainguillotphotography.com, or my regular podcast, which is alainguillot.com, and uh, that's it. Thanks, Alan. I'm looking forward to talking to you pretty soon. Man, thank you. For, yeah, Nate, thank you for talking to me. Thank you, Daniel, for interviewing me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Ever since I met you a couple of years ago, I have seen the way that you continue to grow and to improve yourself and even better, to motivate others and and help others. So thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Now, for the regular listeners, well, today was a special episode, but in a couple of days, I will have another regular episode with an interview with another amazing guest. Until then, please stay tuned, and hopefully I'll see you soon, because there will be a few events being organized here in the city of Montreal. I will make an announcement in the next podcast, but stay tuned and send me a note, say hello, connect with me via Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, or Instagram. So talk to you next week. Goodbye.